at this. The day is beginning in Kentucky. Let's get you into the courtroom. Case remains with the Commonwealth. Uh, call your next witness. Mike Littrell, Your Honor. Counsel, would you spell that for the record, please? L I T T R E L L. All right, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Can you please state your full name? My name is Michael Littrell. And your occupation? I'm a detective and digital forensic examiner for the Kentucky Attorney General's Office. And how long have you been there? Uh, just over six years. And what did you do prior to your current position? Uh, prior to, uh, immediately prior to this position, I uh, taught college for four years full-time. And before that, I have a total of 17 years in law enforcement. And what are the duties of your current position? My current position is kind of a dual role where I do investigations related to child exploitation cases, and I perform digital forensics on cell phones and computers that are brought into the lab. And can you run uh, through your educational background with the jury? Yes. I have a uh, bachelor's degree and a master's degree from Eastern Kentucky University. I have a doctorate from the University of Louisville. Okay. And do you have any training in cell phone forensics? Yes. I have uh, multiple certifications in uh, computer forensics and uh, cell phone forensics. And earlier you mentioned digital forensics. Can you explain to the jurors what that means? Sure. Digital forensics is a process whereby we examine pieces of digital evidence, uh, flash drives, computers, cell phones, and that sort of thing for information relating to whatever case is at hand. And so we're looking for artifacts left behind on phones or computers that, that give us information about whatever case is. And in the case here today, did you perform digital forensics on a cell phone belonging to the defendant? I did. And what was that cell phone? It was an, an Apple iPhone 5S. And what analysis did you provide on that phone? So I, uh, the analysis that I was requested to do for this particular case was what we call a pattern of life analysis. So looking at, in context of things that are going on in the world, going on in, in, in the person's life, in addition to activity that's on the phone, so things like text messages that are coming and going, phone calls, um, you know, emails, web history, things that are going on on the phone and just outlining those in a timeline fashion uh, for the investigator to review. And so what was the first thing that you did? So uh, the first thing that I do is I perform an extraction of the device. And that extraction allows us to pull the information from the device and put it in a format that allows us to examine the contents of the device, in this case the Apple iPhone, uh, using software that is uh, designed for uh, this very purpose. and allows us to look at this, this information in a way that's more user-friendly user and it doesn't change the evidence on the original device. So we can look at text messages and videos and, and anything that's on the phone that is decoded by the software in a nice, easy way. It's very digestible. And what did you do with that information? So with that information, I created a report uh, to provide to uh, the investigator uh, in this case. And for this case, did you, you created a report? I did. Okay. And in that report, I want to run by a couple things with you. You said you did a pattern of life analysis, correct? Yes. So I want to focus with um, pattern of life 
for the 18th of November 2015. Okay. Are you saying L I F E? Life. Yes, Your Honor. And for November 18, what did you do, just generally? So, so generally what I did is I put the, the, the application that we used to put the, the uh, data in that's extracted from the phones. We can look at that in a, in a timeline fashion so we can see things in a chronological order of how they happened on the phone. And so uh, in examining that, I just uh, took, uh, exported things from, from that view um, as it was related to the case and put them in a timeline format so that it was easy to digest what was going on on the phone um, during various times of the day. And on November 18th in the morning, what was uh, things that you were able to extract? So one of the things I looked at was uh, the alarm settings for the phone. And I noticed that there was a repeating alarm set for the weekdays. So during the week, there was an alarm set to go off at 6.40 every morning. So uh, that would be like a repeating alarm for someone would set to wake up you know, every morning at a certain time. So in this case, it was set for 6.40 a.m. And it played the uh, top gun sound as its method of alert. And that morning, was there a period of inactivity? Uh, there was. So uh, for about one hour and 26 minutes, from 7.37 to 9.03, there was no user activity on the phone. And what does that mean when you say uh, inactivity? So there was no uh, user activity, meaning that the user wasn't interacting with the phone. So they weren't sending text messages, they weren't making phone calls, they weren't sending emails. Uh, th there was no um, noticeable activity in terms of, of the user interacting with the device. Okay. And that's 7.37 a.m. to 9.03 a.m., correct? Uh, yes, that's correct. Now I want to focus on the defendant's afternoon activity. What did you provide for the afternoon of the 18th, beginning at around 4 o'clock? So um, around 4.50 uh, p.m., there, the, the phone began to run a backup process. And that backup process is one where it backs up the contents of the phone to the cloud. And in order for, order for this backup process to, to be executed, the phone has to be plugged into the wall, a wall outlet. It has to be connected to Wi-Fi, and it has to be locked. And so when that happens, then the phone begins to run this automated backup process to back up uh, things that have changed to the cloud so that there's a, an active current backup stored in the cloud. So at 4.50 p.m., the phone was connected. Uh, yes, that's when I begin to see artifacts related to this backup process running, which means that that phone had to be plugged in. Plugged in. Okay. And then what do you see? Um, and that, that process runs for, uh, you know, 10 minutes or so. Uh, and then from the period of uh, about 4.53 till about 6.17, so it's about an hour and 24 minutes, there was no activity on the device. So again, there was no user interaction, uh, things coming and going on the device or the device being used by the user for an hour and 24 minutes. That's 4.53 p.m. to 6.17 p.m. on November 18th, correct? Yes, sir, that's correct. <coughs> then what's next? Um, from uh, 643 to 651, there's some text messages that are exchanged. Um, at 655, there is a, a phone call place for just over a minute. And then from 656 p.m. to 802 p.m., approximately an hour and six minutes, there is again no user activity on the phone. What's the next activity on the phone? The next thing that happens is at 8.02, there's a, a text message that is incoming to the device, uh, and then there's a reply one minute later at 8.03. Okay. Uh, next, at 8.50 p.m., there was a one minute, 12 second call, uh, incoming call on the device. And what's the next activity? 
The next activity, again, at 8.50, there was uh, the NOAA radar app. It's a weather, weather radar application was accessed from the device. And that, uh, when that application is accessed, it, it reaches out for a GPS location. And the GPS location uh, on that device uh, geolocates to the defendant's residence. Okay. And that's 8.50 p.m.? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And what's the next activity on that phone? The next activity on the phone is at 11.02 p.m. And, and I see that the media streaming backup process is running once again, so meaning that the phone was, was plugged in. Again, that was at 11.02 p.m. And what's next? Next at 11.27 p.m., the alarm application was open. And again, there was a repeating alarm set for 6.40 a.m., but a new alarm was created at 11.27 p.m. And that alarm was set to, to go off or to alert at 1.10 a.m. And it was going to play the Top Gun uh, theme, or the Top Gun sound as its alert. Okay. So at 11.27 p.m., November 18th, the alarm is changed for 1.10 a.m., the 19th. That's correct. The, the, the alarm is, there's a new alarm created that says go off at 1.10 a.m. And what's the next activity on the phone? The next activity on the phone that we see uh, is, is uh, the next morning at 7.39 a.m. There's no interaction until then, the morning of the 19th. And after your analysis, did you, uh, what did you do with the phone? Uh, return them to the, uh, to the sheriff's office. Just to be clear for the jurors, when you say no activity on the phone, what does that mean? Can you answer that? Sure. Uh, no activity on the phone means that there was, uh, the phone wasn't being used by, by anyone, so there was no text messages, no phone calls, no emails uh, being sent uh, by someone uh, during that time period. No further questions, John. John, I need a, a moment to uh, plug in a computer. All right. <coughs> Do you need some water? No, thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Mr. Adams. 
need to open the door All right, as they get in front of the set here device. for the cross-examination, um, you're looking at the defendant, and then behind the defendant, you're looking at his fiance and her children and other family members, and it's important that what the, the evidence that we just heard, basically, says that this defendant was at home, and the state is alleging that he got up at 1.10 in the morning and went and disposed of the two bodies, burned them in Ed Danzero's car, and then came back later. If that were true, his fiance, would have had to have either not heard him sneak out of the house, out of the front door after his top gun alarm went off at 1.10 a.m., or she's part of it, part of it. That would be uh, the only two scenarios here, and that uh, is what the jury is going to have to grapple with. And it'll be interesting to see what kind of cross-examination we hear here as they get uh, set up with the phone records, because on its surface, the phone activity of the defendant Besides that 110 alarm being set, absolutely helps his case, his, the story that his um, fiance told and her children told um, of his activities that night. Let's listen. There's nothing worth looking at here. Um, mm -hmm. Please don't drop. And that's how it's pronounced, right? Literal. Yes. Literal. I think you told us that you have worked 17 years for law enforcement. Yes, I have 17 total years of law enforcement experience. You worked for uh, uh, college full time, I think, for four years. Four years, yes. In the middle. Did you work for two colleges or one? I worked for a couple different colleges. Right, that's what I thought. Mm -hmm. You worked for Georgetown College okay. in the town of Georgetown. Yes, correct. And you worked for the community college, uh, BCTC. In Lexington. In Lexington, yes. Right. I know where that is. I yes, yes. That. I was the coordinator for the criminal justice program. Okay. And uh, you're associated or have been associated with that part of Kentucky uh, for quite some time. That's where you were in law enforcement, right? In the in Georgetown, yes. Georgetown, right. Yes, correct. Okay. And now you work for the Attorney General's office. I do. That's, that means, as opposed to some of the experts we've seen, right, they work someplace else, but they're brought in um, to work sometimes with the uh, prosecution. You actually work full time with these folks. I do. All right. Now you looked at not just the phone you testified about, you also looked at some other material, right? I performed extractions and provided reports on other devices to the uh, to the investigator. Okay. One of the phones, one of the devices. I'm going to use that. That's your word. I'm going to use your word. Okay. Uh, one of the devices you looked at was Pam Phillips' phone. Okay. I don't, I don't know. You don't know because you don't know the names of the folks. Uh, in your report, which I probably left back on my desk, I did. You talk about an Apple iPhone 5. Yes. I will tell you that that is Pam Phillips' phone. Okay. One of the things that that you were asked to do, if you could, was to do an extraction and get evidence from that device as well. Yes, correct. You tried to do that. I did. You and when I say you tried, you have tools at your disposal that that we wouldn't have. Yes, correct. You actually have um, you have high tech gear that is designed to do exactly that, right? Do extractions? Yes, that's correct. Some of it is hardware, right? This is hardware. Yes, correct. And some of it's software. Yes. Uh, programs and things that your office has purchased and that you're trained on. Yes. In order to do exactly what we're talking about here. Absolutely, yes. Okay. So you were asked 
hey, get, get whatever information you can from this device as well. And you tried. <coughs> yes, correct. But you found that that device had been, um, the word wiped has been used in here before, but do you use a different? Wiped would be the accurate okay. terminology. And that can happen in uh, more than one way, correct? Something can get wiped in more than one way? Uh, for the, an iPhone particularly? Something in general, yes, but an iPhone, there's only one way that that happens. All right, well then tell us what that way is. So in order to, to factory restore, factory reset, or wipe an iPhone, uh, you have to go into the, to the settings menu and you go down um, to, to various levels of the menu and you select reset all, and then you confirm that a couple of times and then it proceeds with wiping the device, meaning that it, uh, that it clears out all of the information currently on the device and resets it to its factory state. So how you would have got it out of the box. And in order to do that, one has to have access in some manner to the device, right? Uh, physically, yes, they'd have to physically have the device, yes. All right. And then also, they have to, if it's passcode protected, they'd have to have the passcode. Yes, you could restore it through iTunes would be a, a, a possible way that you could could restore it that way, um, uh, you know, through through using a, a process through iTunes as well. If you don't know the passcode, but in order to do that, you'd have to have either a secondary device, right? A computer. You would need a computer to to plug it into. Right, and you'd also have to know how to access that person's iTunes. No, you can just uh, you can put put the phone into a special mode, and you can Google this and see it on on the internet. Put into a special mode, plug the phone in, it'll say this phone is, you know, needs to be restored, and then you click the restore button and it'll do the same process as going through, uh, through the wipe process that you would go through on the phone. So anybody can, if they plug it in like you just described, wipe the phone. Yes. that occurred after after a phone is, is white mm -hmm. right? it would begin again to record data once uh, it once it's reset once it, the phone is set back up so once the phone is is established with a new user so in the state where it is in the factory reset mode there would be no data being recorded by the by the device so it's just kind of in a this limbo state until someone were to put their user credentials in or, or whatnot and actually set up the device for their use. Right. One way you could set up a device would be um, by bringing that device uh, to a store, right? And having them help you walk through it. Yep, certainly. And I want to make sure it's clear, you tried, right, to, you examined that device, and if there had been anything on it, you would have told us today. Yes, if I would have been able to perform an extraction, and then yes, I was unable to perform an extraction on the device because it was in the, that uh, um, factory, factory state. Right. We've heard that, uh, that there were records from the cell phone provider, right? Those are totally different than what we're talking about. Yes, that's correct. The call detail records would be separate from this, yes. And those are kept by the actual provider, um, and they're not kept in the phone. They're kept in where, wherever they keep those files, right? In Atlanta or? Yes, some, some phones record just some cell tower information, but by and large, the records you're talking about are kept by the provider, so by AT&T or Verizon or whomever. Right. Now, you did an extraction successfully. Say again. You did a successful extraction on the, uh, on the phone of Mr. Martin. I did. All right. And no one had reset that? No. Nope. Right. No one had wiped that? No. Nope.
you are not the only expert um, employed by the prosecution to examine the phones in this case, right? I believe they were, I think they were examined prior, um, I think around the original time they were seized, I believe they were, they were examined then. By another expert? I don't know, but I think by the state police, maybe, I'm not sure who did the examination the first time. Didn't you actually meet the other expert? That did the original extractions on the phones? No. That examined the the phones and the phone records in this case? I met with the FBI agent who uh, examined the call detail record information, but right. I did not meet with the person who did the original extractions of the phones when they were originally uh, examined. Right. You met with the expert who examined the call detail data? I did. When you did the extraction, in this case, on Mr. Martin's phone, you said that when the data comes out, uh, it provides basically a big old report, right? So when the data comes out, it puts it into like a compressed file, mm -hmm. and that compressed file is read by the forensic tools, and the information contained in that compressed file is then decoded by the forensic tools uh, to give us a, a format that is easily digestible. All right easily digestible to you, right? Well, certainly it's a, a, a subjective, I suppose. That report is, uh, has multiple components, right? Yes, yeah, so it would contain things like text messages, emails, yep. videos, um, you know, all kinds of stuff that were, that were decoded from the phone. Um, and the total report, and you may not have this in front of you, does, does 2,000 600 plus pages sound about right if you printed it? I don't print them because of that reason, but I've, I've uh, seen um, attorneys who like to print them yeah. and they can be thousands of pages. Yes. Attorneys do like to print those they things, do. don't they? Uh, so it wouldn't surprise you if the report you printed in this case would run in excess of 2,000 possibly 2,600 pages. That wouldn't surprise me. One of the functions that's available for that report is to create a timeline within that report, right? Yes, correct. I'm going to try. Thank you. 
United States uh, demonstrative. on the screen is coming from her computer. Yeah. Don't know why what's on her screen isn't on it. There, there. Extraction report was, as I said, 2,000 plus pages. Okay. Your Honor, may I approach the witness? Yes. Okay. I am handing you a copy of the extraction report from Saturday the 14th through. Um, Friday the 20th. Uh, you guys have the, the full piece. You gave it to me. Here's a copy of what we're talking about. This isn't the extraction that I did. It's, that's the timeline function for those days. Not of the report that I did. No, no, not your report. I'm okay. saying the report that you, the extraction you did. And, this and, isn't my extraction. This was one that was done previous by someone else. You did examine the extraction. I performed a new extraction, different than the extraction that was performed here. So that's the extraction provided by the prosecution to us. Because this extraction was created in 2017. All right. I did the extraction in April of this year. You would agree that the phone extraction, uh, one would hope, has the same material, right? Um, well. There's different levels of extraction, and this, this extraction was a, an advanced logical extraction, which would not provide the same detail of information that the uh, full file system extraction that I performed did. So the full file system extraction I did would provide more information in terms of, uh, of phone usage information. But you would agree that the material on that extraction would come from the bottom, right? I, I don't know. I've not reviewed this, so I don't know if this is the same information or not. I can assume that, but I don't know that's to be the case. I don't know where, I don't know that what this extraction was from. It says on on the document what it's from. Yes, I see that. Okay. And it's specifically the dates of Saturday the fourteenth of November 2015 through the 20th of November. I don't know. I've never seen this before. So Your this Honor, is my first time seeing this. Point, the yes, come up here, counsel. All right, we've got a little issue here. The defense obviously has a game plan with the cross-examination. They were just ramping up, and then they realized, oh, rut row, this guy didn't do the extraction that we wanted to question him about, Kirlin Abernathy. This is called uh, a derailing of your momentum. Uh, this is not what you had planned uh, for the defense. He's going to try to get this witness to answer these questions, but... Boy, what, what do you think is going to happen here? 
Uh, it appears that the prosecution either didn't give them the right report or, I mean, they look very angry there at that sidebar trying to figure out what's going on. That witness is very flustered. Um, <laughs> yeah, they're going to have to get the momentum back. I mean, he was on a roll. Defense attorney was on a roll and then... <laughs> this is not my report. <laughs> right, yeah, and he... My goodness. It, we don't know where it was going, but he clearly was setting it up. He brought the computer up. He had his stacks of the uh, um, reports ready to roll, and um, now the witness is telling him, oh, you got the wrong guy here. I didn't prepare any of this. It's interesting, we did find out then, the Commonwealth had an initial extraction done, and then in April of this year they had this individual, Michael Literal, um, do another extraction to see if maybe some information changed. And he, as he kind of explained that his was a little bit of a, more of a deeper dive, um, that also shows a little weakness, does it not? Yes, that is interesting why they did one back in 2017 and then why did they have to do one now? Why didn't they do a better report back then? It's very interesting. And why don't they have the correct report, as they seem to be arguing very furiously about? Yeah, and there's some discovery issues that have popped up er earlier. There was another incident, incident where um, the defense had a different report than the witness. It was a report that was not turned over in discovery. It was changed. And, and that did frustrate the judge a bit, and you can see the judge is frustrated again, and <laughs> so is the defense. We might be uh, having a little extended delay here as they iron this out. It's obviously something that's very important to the defense. Um, so we'll have to see what happens here. When the camera goes to the seal, that means the jury is exiting the courtroom, and you can see everybody standing up as well. So. This is going to be discussed in open court. The judge wanted the jury to be removed because it appears to be an extended argument that's going to ensue here. Let's talk about the, the overall information that we got from this witness, though, from the state standpoint. His phone activity really doesn't point the finger at him doing anything wrong because it mirrors what his uh, family members in the house said he did that night. Exactly. The only thing that is questionable and suspect is that 1 a.m. alarm that the, he set. That would be interesting to see what they have to say about that well, later. They, you were they claimed he was checking a kerosene you. heater. Let's go back in. The witness to examine is something that he has not been aware of before, as he said, a moment ago, this is the first time he's ever seen it. Judge, it's the data from the phone that you just testified about. It's the same data, it's the cell right extraction, uh, for the same reason that uh, Lieutenant Smith testified about photos that he didn't take himself, but he's able to look at them and say, that photo is a picture of that object, I recognize it, and then testified about it. Whether he took it out of the phone himself or not, it's a cell bright extraction. He's a cell bright expert. He knows what he's talking yes, about. but it's like you're asking him to say, is what's on this, what's on what I've just handed you, the same thing that's in your report? He's not going to know that until he's had a chance to look at it. I wasn't going to ask him the same thing in his report, Judge. Well, what were you going to ask him? I was going to do the same thing that Mr. Garcia did, which is to walk him through some of the events that are reflected in the Selbright data. Well, that, that, well and good. But he's familiar with the events that he extracted from the phone. And like he said, he can assume that what you've handed him is is from that phone, and uh, but he's not going to know that. Judge, it's the same data. It's the same thing. It's the, it's the data they provided us in discovery. They said this is the extraction from Mr. Martin's phone. Here is all the data. The calendar. And they also apparently told you that it was from somebody else, not him, and three years later. 
But now he's created a report over a different extraction. Now you say that, but I want to get to the bottom of that too. Does the Commonwealth, can the Commonwealth show me that that extraction was, was provided in discovery? And if it wasn't, why are we waiting till now to find that out? Carolyn Abernathy, you ever see this happen? I mean, the state doesn't know whether they've provided it or not, it seems. It's, I don't think I've seen it happen in any of my cases personally, but I mean, this case has so much, I mean, just the, what was the report? He said approximately 2,000 plus pages alone. I mean, that's, you've got all these witnesses, all this, this forensic type evidence. I mean, uh, I hope they have a good record of when they gave it over. Usually you have a very specific list of these are the things we gave over exactly. and then you sign off the date. Seems like it would be hard to overlook 2,600 pages of paperwork. I don't think they're suggesting they provided it in paper, Judge. I think they may be suggesting they provided it as a file. Oh. Uh, like on a zip drive or something? On an external hard drive. <clears throat> Look, it was one of the downloads that we had recently done. All right. Well, so what are we going to do? We're going to have Dr. Lipsville, uh look at it or compare what you want him to testify about with what he has on his records day for day. And, and for that matter, who did the one you're talking about? Who is the person who prepared the document that you have as an exhibit? And why didn't he hear or she hear? It's not, that wasn't our, first of all, it's not a document. It's just like you plug the phone in and it's a program that's, that pulls everything off of it. So we have the one, the earlier one. We, I assume it was their first cell phone expert that did it. I mean, we got it from them. One of our people didn't pull the cell right. So they would have to wait to that. All right. Well, so what? Do we need to give this witness an opportunity to compare the exhibits that you, the exhibits that you have with his work and tell you if where they're consistent and where they're not? Is that where you're headed? It, it is not, Judge. I was going to ask him questions. Um, the same way that Mr. Garcia did, walking him through the material that's presented in the cell right. Extraction. Material that he did not create and has not reviewed. It's not a creatable document. It's, it's a data dump. It's not like a work product. It's just a data pull off of a phone. Judge, if I may, the extraction that was performed, this, this extraction that was performed, will have substantially less data than the extraction that I pulled because of the technology that it changed from 2017 to 2021, the, the type of extraction is completely different. So there'll be potentially thousands of more data points in the extraction that I pulled than in this one. And this one appears that the time zone is off as well by an hour. So, it is off by an hour. So, but we were, yeah, the, so you, that's, that's the universal time code thing that that yeah. Lieutenant Smith actually we, We've about. covered that. Okay. Yeah, so it's <laughs> off by you know, but Judge, would it help you if 
we're not going, we're actually asking about very shallow time stamp data. We're not going to ask him about the things that he gets in his fancy report that we don't have access to. We're asking him about the data that we do have access to, which is like it should be time the text messages. It's, like right. it's not like the text messages change in the years the phones weren't, weren't being used. All right. Is it conceded that the report that the defense is trying to uh, uh, elicit information from this witness about part of the discovery. It is something that the Commonwealth has provided to them. Yes, sir. All right. To the extent that this witness can answer your questions then, Mr. Griffiths, I will allow him to testify. But he will have to, he will have an opportunity to explain or qualify his answers based on his expertise and frankly, apparently, his unfamiliarity with this report. Okay? Yes, Judge. All right. Bring the jury back in. Does the time zone part? Okay, Carolyn Abernathy, good decision by the judge there. Let's uh, let it roll. Yeah, I, I mean, I think so, given with where they are. I mean, it was discovery provided. Um, and like he said, the witness is going to be able to qualify his answer. So I think that's fair to the prosecution. And then the jury's just going to have to be able to, you know, take take the information that the defense is trying to get across for what it's worth. I mean, it may be good, it may be bad, but I think the judge made a made a pretty good call there. Yeah, it appears to in be in proper sync, uh, so we like the jury dump. can see the evidence oh, and not just speculate about it. Well, okay. all right, well, they worked all this out. We'll step aside, take a break as we approach the top of the hour. We'll be right back after this. Welcome back to Court TV Live. Glad you're with us on this Thursday as we continue our coverage of the Commonwealth of Kentucky versus Christian Kit Martin. The defense is trying to cross-examine a cell phone expert that was brought up by prosecutors during direct, and there was a little bit of a hiccup in terms of the information that both sides had concerning a cell phone dump off of several devices, including the defendant, Kit Martin's. There... They seem to have come to an agreement on how to continue forward. This witness will be answering the questions from the defense. Now they're trying to work out the best way to project the information to the jury, either via the overhead projector or the computer. And they've had some technical issues, which happens very often. Kirlyn Abernathy is with us. And also joining us this morning is Michelle Thomas, criminal defense attorney. Um, Michelle, welcome. This happens, does it not, in courtrooms? The it gremlins does. Yeah. You kick in. It's something that oh, I it looks created. like they figured so it out. Let's go uh, back what in. What's going to be up on the screen? Okay. This is the same thing I'm seeing here. Yes. Okay. Well, it's the well, thing you're trying to see on the screen there. there. Uh, the Commonwealth have a copy. They don't judge because I didn't think I was going to be. Uh, do you want us to print one, Judge? I'll make a copy here. Pardon? I'll make a copy. Hand that to me. I'll make a copy right here. And, Judge, just to be clear, like the Commonwealth's uh, uh, PowerPoints, this is not, it's not an exhibit. It's just something to help the jury understand that I testified.
Do you want a second to look at that? I'm, I'm just glancing in here. Sure. Okay. Tell me when you're done. As we see Judge Atkins taking the lead, making the copies up at the bench. Michelle Thomas, little hiccups like this, um, very common. And um, the judge figured out a plan how this can proceed. Seems to be the right decision. It appears to be. It is quite common for there to be discovery disputes and disputes about how evidence will be presented, whether it should be presented. The rules of evidence are quite technical in nature. But I think that the judge is making the right decision here and, and coming up with a, a means through which we can, in fact, get through the evidence and make sure that all the relevant pieces are presented to the jury. Ultimately, that's the goal. Yeah, but it is quite common. And it's going to be interesting to see where the defense is going. They were ramping up in their right. cross uh, before this hiccup. Um, looks like the judge has finished making copies for the state and uh, they're ready to roll. Let's listen. See if it helps. It does help. Thank you very much. And could you zoom in on it a little bit? Thanks. Good, good. We lost the word Saturday, but as long as everybody knows it's Saturday. So I'd like you to, I'm going to actually ask you a question now. Okay. Uh, you've had a chance to examine uh, that document. This one? Yes. Yes. As I said, that's a document I made, not a document that you have anything to do with, but it's a summary of the material in the cell bright extraction that I handed you before. Okay. And you have this document, yes. which was originally provided to us in Discovery, and this is a cell bright extraction, it or a portion of a cell bright extraction. Yes. All right. And in particular, the cell bright extraction that you're holding is from the 10th of November of... Yes, sorry. The 14th of November, Saturday of 2015. That's the first part. Is that what, right? Yes. Okay. And it goes until the 20th of November of 2015. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> that cell bread extraction contains Things like phone calls, right? Yes. Text messages. Yes. Calendar um, notations. Yes. Okay. I'd like to turn your attention to page one thousand two hundred sixty-four which is only about the fourth page of your document. Okay. <clears throat> At 12 noon, oh, and just to be clear, the you, you were saying before, and I can't remember if the jury was in here or not, this is a document 
which also starts with the universal time code, the UTC. Yes. Right? Yes. So in order to figure out what time it is, you have to do, you have to look at it. You're an expert. You can, you can figure out what time it is looking at that, right? Right. So when the extraction performed at our office with this device, um, it was set to Eastern time, but the phone, when in use, would have been in Central Standard Time in November. So that would have been uh, minus six hours instead of minus five hours. Right. So I guess what I'm asking you, when I'm asking my questions, I'm going to ask my question based on the actual correct time. Okay. If I mess it up, you'll you'll let me know, right? Okay. You weren't here before, but there was a there was some earlier testimony where the the UTC time came in, and then math was done, and then there was a result. I'm going to go straight to the result. But if we need to at any time, you let me know and we can... Sure. So all these will be just subtract one hour. Right. To get them to the correct time zone. To give the correct time. Uh, okay. I already asked you to turn to page uh, 1,264. Yes. And can you look near the uh, bottom of the page and find an entry for what would be 12 noon? A calendar entry. Yes. And what does that uh, calendar entry say? Dr. K. Can you tell us the next entry, which is also marked at noon? Uh, looks like a group text message thread. Not an actual text message thread. And the text message is for the, the multiple um, recipients is all set here. Yes. Right. Then there are um, several texts, uh, right, from different people. Yes. I'd like you to turn to the next page which is page 1,265. You need to flip it on the exhibit, don't you? No, it's, is still, it on there? No, it's, a, it's a summary of the day. That, <coughs> oh, all right, all right, I'm sorry. No, you're fine, Rich. Can you find a 1 p.m. Uh, entry? I think it's the third entry down. Okay. Do you see that, sir? It's a call. And it, is it an outgoing call or an incoming call? It's an incoming call. All right. And how long is the incoming phone call that is received at 1 p.m.? It's like an hour and a half. One hour, 33 minutes, 10 seconds. OK. I'm going to move now to the next day. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm going to move two days later to Monday. And I'll give you the page in a second, but I'm trying to get this thing. Sure. I understand. I think it's the same actual page, just further down. Let's see if I did that right. Monday begins on page 1,271. 1,271. And I want to direct you to the bottom of 1,271, uh, the second entry from the bottom. Okay. That is a calendar entry, sir? Yes. And it says Catherine, correct? It does. And is marked. It also indicates in the calendar entry what time 
it would be right next to the word Catherine? Yes. What does it say? Uh, it says 10.30, so uh, 9.30 uh, Central Standard Time. And, and I guess I asked that poorly. So the timestamp is 9.30, but also next to the word Catherine on 12.71, what does it say? It says 0, 0.930. Okay, so the, both the written stamp is 9.30 in the morning, and also the actual time recorded by the phone is 9.30 for yes. the calendar entry. Okay, correct. On the next page, which is 1272, there are uh, texts between, uh, let me see here, find them in my right spot. They say instant message. It's fair to call that a text. Do you want me to call it an instant message? Uh, I, yes, I, I just it's just a message. I don't know what kind of message it was. It was a, te uh, if it was a text or a message or a Facebook message. I don't know. Okay. And I, I actually, could you, you when you were talking, you were oh, looking sorry. down. Sometimes that makes it less audible sure. for everybody. Okay. Do you see um, entry number one two seven one two? Yes. Um, what does that say as the content for the text? It says, for the POA. now to the next day, which means I have to flip this. And that would be Tuesday, November 17th. I'm actually going to They're looking through, there's, there's phone activity during the day, right, on that day? Oops. On Tuesday? On the 17th? Yes, sir. And I can give you a page reference if you need it. Just looking through the entire day? Sure. It's pages 1273, 1274. 75. Yes, correct. 1276. And then I believe it ends on 1277. So it's fair to say that there's, there's pages of activity for Tuesday? Yes, correct. Okay. You know, I think uh, I think I might come back to that day. Um, so 
is I wanted to make a different point. This report. Which report? The this one. Yes. Okay. Ends on the twentieth, which is Friday. Okay. And at that time, activity by Mr. Martin ceases. Okay. Because his phone is is taken. That's when his phone is actually taken into the custody of the police. Okay. Uh, now I want to go back to Wednesday. Okay. You have testified earlier this morning in some detail about, about Wednesday and the things that you were able to determine from your extraction, right? Yes, correct. You talked about um, portions where there was activity, right? Yes. And here, I didn't mean to, let's see if I've done this correct. Is, is it, have one say there? Yeah, okay. Kind of gets much less down there. Um, let's see. I'm going to move this to include the later portions of Wednesday. <clears throat> but as you sit here today, you're not trying to testify about anything other than the data from your extraction, correct? Correct. Uh, and then the extraction of, of the phones. I know you did sure. multiple things, right? Sure. You're not testifying that you necessarily know the import, uh, that's a terrible word to use, um, the significance of any of the particular um, things you determined from your cell right, right? Right. Uh, and you also don't know what did or didn't happen during periods of activity or inactivity. Correct. Unless there are obvious things like text messages, emails, things of that nature. Sure. Otherwise, no. So when you testify about a period of inactivity, that's not a strange activity on, on phones, is it? No, not necessarily. Many people have periods of inactivity, right? Sure. You have periods of inactivity on your phone? Like now. <laughs> <laughs> so you're not testifying as to any criminal actions on the part of Mr. Martin during any of this. No. You're just here to say, I'm a, an expert on phones, right? Yes. I looked at a phone, yes. I looked at and multiple devices. Sure, yes. <clears throat> and from my best ability, this is what I could tell from those devices. Yes. And this is what I couldn't tell from those devices. Yes. Thank you, sir. I don't have any further questions. You're direct. I don't know. They may. They may. I don't know if they're going to ask you. Just one question, Your Honor. We had talked about, or defense counsel had asked you about the, um, the phone, as he phrased it, being wired. If your knowledge of phones, if you press, if a phone is locked and you try to pass the password too many times, what happens to it? If the user has enabled the option to wipe that phone after 10 attempts, the phone will wipe as well. Okay. So if someone attempts to get into it 10 times with the wrong passcode, it will automatically 
wife? Yes, that's correct. No further questions? I have no other questions, sir. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take the morning break a little bit early today, and it's going to be a little bit shorter. Uh, so we're going to take 10 minutes. Uh, if everyone would please allow the jury uh, the opportunity to exit the courtroom first, we would appreciate that. And we will be back in here at, uh, let's say, let's say 25 till 11, please. Thank you. Okay, there it is. The defense had a very strategic cross-examination of the cell phone expert. We don't know the whole story, but we will find out as the trial continues. The jury taking a break. We'll do the same. Be right back after this. Stay with us.